can't make you feel, but I can't make you think. Your sperm's in the garden, your love's in the sea. Yeah. So you write yourselves over the fields, and you make all your animal fields, and your wise men don't know how it feels. Yes, to be thick as a brick. So I've been asked to address these questions. And let me say straight away that I can't. This is not just because I don't think the questions actually make any sense. There are actually more significant reasons than that. Our minds evolved in what Dawkins has described as Middle Earth. And thus we have a reasonable understanding and intuition of the average, the moderate and the mundane. But that understanding and intuition breaks down when we move from our comfort zone in Middle Earth and seek to comprehend extremes, the very fast, the very large, the very small, or the very cold. As with our minds, so too our vocabulary evolved in Middle Earth, and as with our intuition and understanding, so too does our language fail at these extremes. When we first learn of the atom, we are likely to be taught about the Bohr model. We picture solid objects orbiting around a collection of solid spheres, Perhaps we imagine planets orbiting a star, as with our solar system. Or billiard balls. OK, forget the billiard balls. Later we are taught that these things are not solid objects moving in a Newtonian world, but they have properties of waves. Then, if we persevere, we may learn of the double slit experiment, and these things, such as electrons, are neither particles nor waves. They may display properties of both, but they are neither. Our intuition fails at this point, as does our language. The best we can do, so far as language is concerned, is to fall back upon the familiar wave-particle duality, collapse of the wave function. But this language does little to help our understanding, and it gets more complicated still when we discover that protons and neutrons at the centre of an atom are made up of quarks, and a variety of quarks to boot. But we can't stop at quarks. It's far more obtruse than that. What you are seeing here is a computer simulation of, well, I'll let Lawrence Krauss explain. This is the space inside of a proton, the empty space inside of a proton. Not where the quarks are, but the empty space between the quarks. And these propagations, or fields, are not insignificant. Most of the mass of the proton comes not from the quarks within a proton, but from the empty space between the quarks. These fields popping in and out of existence, produce about 90% of the mass of a proton. And since protons and neutrons are the dominant stuff in your body, the empty space is responsible for 90% of your mass. Is this substance? Is this foundational? My point is, at this scale, at this dimension, words are almost meaningless. Consider black holes. What are they made of? So, are black holes made of anything? Made of anything? Black hole... Hmm. We don't really have any idea what's going on, so... Um. There is one language that comes closer than any other to describing these things. The universal language of mathematics. Although, whilst it is universal, it is not universally understood. One plus one equals five. But even mathematics has its limitations. Einstein's equations of general relativity simply say the following. The Ricci curvature tensor minus one half the metric tensor times the contracted curvature tensor is proportional to the stress energy tensor. All this says that if I start with a star, a black hole, or even a universe, that determines the curvature that surrounds that concentration of matter and energy. But inside these equations, there's a monster. In the extreme gravity at the core of a black hole, Einstein's equations spiral wildly out of control. After a very long, tedious calculation, I mostly get zeros, but the non-zero term is given as follows. M is the mass of the black hole, 
R describes the distance from the black hole, here is the problem. Right there, when R is equal to zero, the point at which physics itself breaks down. So one over R equals one over zero equals infinity. To a mathematician, infinity is simply a number without limit. To a physicist, it's a monstrosity. It means that, first of all, gravity is infinite at the center of a black hole, that time stops, and what does that mean? Space makes no sense. It means the collapse of everything we know about the physical universe. In the real world, there's no such thing as infinity. Therefore, there is a fundamental flaw in the formulation of Einstein's theory. And that is just one example of the limitation of our understanding. Let me throw in another. Current ideas suggest that dark energy and dark matter make up 95% of the universe, and no one has the faintest idea what it is. 95% of the universe is unknown to us, and even the 5% that we are aware of we do not fully understand. There remains an unfathomable wealth of knowledge and understanding to come. I won't be here to see it, and even if I were, I'm sure I wouldn't understand it. There are limitations to my understanding, and that frustrates me. What I would give to spend one day in the mind of Einstein, Turing, or Feynman. But I do have sufficient intelligence to appreciate that I'm thick as a brick. So going back to the questions, I cannot possibly answer them, save perhaps for the third. I am fairly confident that no one knows. That's why I consider it funny when I hear scientists being described as arrogant and that science claims to know everything. This is such a misrepresentation of the position that it would be funny if it were not so offensively inaccurate. Science knows it doesn't know everything. Science is excited by unknowns. Scientists are tickled by the rub of discovery. Curiosity is its driving force. And if, on occasion, science does claim to have knowledge, such claims are based on solid foundations, foundations of evidence, provable evidence. Let's have a look at a few more of those so-called arrogant scientists before moving on to what I consider to be true arrogance. Oh, okay, already you've asked me a question that I can't answer. One thing is I can live with doubt and uncertainty and not knowing. I think it's much more interesting to live not knowing than to have answers which might be wrong. I have approximate answers and possible beliefs and different degrees of certainty about different things, but I'm not absolutely sure of anything. And there are many things I don't know anything about, such as whether it means anything to ask why we're here and what the question might mean. I might think about it a little bit. If I can't figure it out, then I go to something else. I don't understand black holes. I love black holes. I love black holes because I don't understand them. The singularity is when our understanding of nature breaks down. That's what a singularity is. Compare that humility and the acceptance of ignorance with the outrageous arrogance of some of the religious. Those that will tell you with certainty how and why everything is as it is. And where do they get this insight from? Oh, come on. Do you really need a clue? Okay. So the Bible says, now in Romans chapter number one, in Romans 6, 23 is in Second Thessalonians 2, 11, and beginning with Isaiah 43, Numbers chapter number 21, from Romans 6, 23, that's Isaiah 53, 6. In Matthew 13, and Romans 3 says, John chapter three, Jesus said in John 5, 24, John 14, 6, John 5, 46, that's Romans 5, 8. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, Genesis 1, 26, and John 5, 4, Numbers chapter number two. Uh, you know what I'm, I, I hope you know what I'm trying to say. These are the people that will tell you all of this was created so that man could scrape out an existence on part of the crust of an average planet orbiting an average star in an average galaxy. These are the people who will tell you that they know the mind of God. They know 
who their God wants you to share a bed with, what you can eat, what you can wear, and most outrageously of all, what will happen to you after you die. Of course, they have absolutely no evidence to support any of this, other than their own subjective interpretation of an old book and the inconsequential accounts of personal experience. And how tragic and how chronically banal are their explanations when they do venture into the realms of science. Why does the outside of a galaxy spin ten times too fast? Faster than its inside? When gravity and physics tells us this cannot be? Because it's the hand of God that operates it. How shallow, how desperate, how pathetic. Their certainty is nothing to be admired. It's to be pitied. But it should also be seen for what it is. Utter pig-headed arrogance.